what I'd like to do tonight is what, what we have here really is kind of the choir, right? We have a lot of people here who really understand the proposition of sustainability that we're all facing right now. Um, we have a lot of things that are um, stacked up against us. Uh, every time we pick up, you know, Sierra Club's here tonight. Uh, every time I get my Sierra Club magazine, I kind of go through it. Uh, I try and do it not too late at night because I always get kind of halfway depressed by the time I'm through it. Uh, I'm excited because of all the people that are doing things about what we're trying to do, but at the same time, every time I see another species going extinct or another statistic that we're discovering, what we're doing to the planet, it quite frankly gets depressing. And I know that we all kind of face that. We kind of curl up in this ecological, you know, ball of depression. So what I'd like to do is kind of share a strategic vision of what's important because what I discovered was that there is some optimism. There is some hope in this. There is something that we can do because I think that's part of the kind of the feelings that we get is what really can we do? You know, we sit around and talk about stuff all the time or read one more article and it just really, uh, it, it gets to be very heavy after a while. So since we're kind of all of the same mind here and we have the opportunity to understand the problem and maybe what we can do about it, what I thought I'd do tonight is feed you a little bit with a fire hose. Right, because I know that you all kind of get this. And so I'm going to I'm gonna do a little bit of a combination of the personal and the strategic to begin with. W what I was facing from a strategic problematic point of view and how I've decided to kind of work out a personal solution to what I was discovering that was in face of us. So just by way of a little bit of introduction, I started off um, in about 1979 and started an architecture and construction company in Claremont. And I started building homes, doing a lot of historic restoration work. Uh, this is the home of the founder of Pomona College, built in um, 1887. We restored that for Pomona College. Um, we do new homes, um, both kind of classic and more contemporary. And I was spending 30 years in my profession loving everything that I was doing. Feeling that I was doing beautiful design, beautiful quality work, homes that were going to last for decades. Until this magazine showed up in my mailbox. Metropolis, 2003, a whole study done by Architecture 2030, Ed Masria. There's a couple here, there's, there's about four or two chairs here. Come, come on up, yeah. Might as well get comfortable. This magazine in 2003 opened my eyes to the fact that carbon being spewed into the atmosphere is mostly caused by buildings. I was always under the impression that certainly it was automobiles or industry, all those dirty factories pumping out uh, noxious fumes. Well, in fact, buildings consume 48% of all of the energy produced and used in this country and an equivalent amount of greenhouse gases, right? So this was very shocking to me. In fact, buildings in the United States consume more energy than any other country except for China, right? So that was a little bit depressing to me when I discovered that my sector, the sector I've spent my entire career on, was really responsible for probably, arguably, the biggest problem that we're facing on the planet today from a global perspective. We've got about 
of embodied energy, the energy that's used to create concrete and ship materials and make hardwood floors and produce the buildings. And then the rest of it is to keep the lights on and the heating and air conditioning running, right? Shocking to me. In fact, 75% of all of the electricity produced in this country goes to keeping the lights on and the HVAC running in our buildings, right? I didn't know that. So when you think about it, it really is, it really is the buildings. Buildings can produce, the urban environments produce 75% of the greenhouse gases that we're facing on the planet today. Do you know where that last city was? That's Shanghai. Shanghai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's a fabulous view from, from the boot there. And, uh, but you start looking at cities like this with a different perspective when you understand kind of the consequences that we haven't really, really understood at this point. So this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They've been putting out reports all along. The last one is, is very pointed that all of our predictions about the results of spewing these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere have been not scary enough. <laughs> All of the major scientific organizations in the country and in the world have climbed on to support all of this data showing we better wake up and we better do something fast and this is where it can get depressing. Because business as usual is not a pretty picture. All of those scientists and the intergovernmental inter panel is suggesting that by 2047, if we continue what we're doing, that the hottest, the, the coldest day in 1947 will be warmer than the warmest day ever. Right? We, by the time we get out to 1947, the fluctuation of Hot to cold, I'm sorry, thank you very much. 20, 2047, we will cross over a threshold where the heat will build up so dramatically that we will leave what we've known for a long, long time for life on the planet. So this is, this is becoming more and more understood and more and more quantified as we move forward by the entire scientific community so that Business as usual for life as we know it as usual will be severely threatened if we pass over two degrees centigrade, right? These are formulas that people are working on and crunching all the time. Business as usual, starting in 1960, we've, started, we've been tracking this and this has been the gigatons of, of greenhouse gases produced up until about uh, 2005 is when we really started getting interested in this subject and starting to think that we really had something to do with it. If we continue on that curve from now to 2100, we will produce by burning fossil fuels and into the atmosphere two trillion tons of carbon. Right? So we're starting to get some quantification of this. Well, in order to prevent less than two degrees centigrade climate change difference, we will have to not send more than 0.5 trillion tons of uh, greenhouse gas into the atmosphere, right? So we're starting to quantify. How much can we burn? We know what the goal is now. It's pretty clear. So there are a lot of scenarios being run. There are scenarios, this is business as usual, there are scenarios peaking in 2080, emissions peaking in 2040 and like back down into 2020, right? This is a pretty good scenario right here. This is a global scenario that many people around the planet are talking about. This scenario is one of the best, but it's still has a 33% chance of not making it. This is not, these are not good odds. So there is a fifth scenario that the IPCC has come up with and they're saying that if we use 
efficiency to the maximum extent that we can, there is a scenario that we can actually peak emissions in 2016 and start bending the curve down to a carbon neutral building stock around the world by about 2060, right? This gives us a greater than 85% chance to stay below 2 degrees. So this is really what we're up against. It's known, it's quantifiable. This is a huge opportunity because now we're starting to identify what the problem is. It's not, it's, it's not a mystery. It's very understood that buildings are the problem. And if buildings are the problem, this really depressed me from the beginning and I had to sit back and really take stock. But what we know about buildings is that 50% of the energy used in all buildings that have been built before the last five years, 50% of the energy we're using in buildings is wasted due to old technology, due to the way that we constructed it, due to the light bulbs that we're using, due to the fact that our heating and air conditioning systems are inefficient, due to the fact that really we've built out our planet with the idea that energy was free and it was infinite in supply and it really had no consequences, right? That we kind of all thought that for a long time. Did you say 15 or 50? 50, 5-0, thank you. 5-0. So, what I decided to do was join the energy efficiency revolution that was starting to happen. 70% of the major architecture firms in the world now have climbed on to climate change scenarios to help work on climate change. Builders and architects all over the country have gotten on board. So, for example, what I did in my com company uh, this is a, a green and green that we have in Claremont. Um, we were hired to restore, fully restore that green and green. And when we did that, um, Greenpoint rating in California is our Greenpoint rating uh, system in California. This was actually the first historic building that was Greenpoint rated in California. So essentially what we did is we did the same beautiful work that we all used did before but we approached energy very, very differently. We approached the insulation and the air sealing and the HVAC systems and the lighting in a very different way, as if every kilowatt that we were spending mattered tremendously. So we reduced dramatically the amount of energy that that building uses. So we still have the same beautiful building. It's now just more durable and more healthy and more comfortable and way less expensive to operate. I created a, um, a, a, a residential infill project in downtown Santa Barbara. Uh, my partner who moved in four years ago has never turned on his heater. He has to turn it on once a year just to make sure that it still works. We have 14,000 gallons of water in the basement that we collect all the water that's coming off. We've got 35 fruit producing fruit trees, uh, organic garden. Um, all of the windows are tuned to the position of the sun so it either collects or, re or rejects heat. We've got solar panels to offset the rest. We wanted to do this as a demonstration project to prove that things like this are really possible and can be very beautiful at the same time. This is one of the units inside. We also won an International Sustainable Sites Award for the garden because Low energy and low water are a complete nexus in Southern California, very important. Architects around the world are developing protocols to build buildings in a much more radically energy efficient way. This is a, a building in Germany. This is an infrared shot with snow on the ground. And you can see this building was built with what they call passive house technology. The building was built to be basically a thermos that people live in. So you can see the standard building that was built in old protocol with all the heat running out of the building. This building, the only heat coming out is where somebody on the third floor, it was probably too warm inside, so they cracked a window to let some of the heat out. Because these buildings don't even have heaters. They're heated with the ovens and the hair dryers and the people and the lighting in the buildings. And this is in the snow in Germany, right? 
very, very exciting things happening. So are we making progress? This is, this is one of the things I was excited to talk about today. Um, in Chicago at the um, AIA convention this year, um, we st some of these statistics started to come out. This is U.S. building operations in terms of energy use in quads, quadrillions. You know, one quad is equal to about 35 to 40, 500 megawatt coal fire electricity generating plants, right? So quads are a lot of energy. Building started off in 2005 using about 40 quads a year of energy. One of the things I wanted to show you is what's happening is they're starting to measure now the curve of the differences in how we're constructing buildings. And so we can go from 2007 before the recession, 2009, 2010, <coughs> after the recession, half of this is from recession and half of this is from working on building codes and tightening up buildings and just paying attention to, to the energy. 2010, 13, and 2014 now, we're starting to flatten off the curve in terms of all U.S. building operations, mostly commercial and municipal, big giant buildings, right? This is what starts getting exciting. From 2005, if we had stayed on business as usual, there would have been no savings. We would have spent 500 and $60 billion more on energy in this country in buildings than we did. $560 billion is about the equivalent that Congress appropriated to get to spend to get us out of the recession. Right? Now, because of these things that are instituted, the cool thing about energy efficiency is that it's an annuity. Right? If you change all your light bulbs and you make the expense this year and it's paid off in a year and a half because of the expense, that present you gave yourself keeps on giving for the rest of the time that you own that building, correct? So we paid down, we've worked really, really hard in the building industry to get the amount of energy that we're using down below what we were using, and this is, this is even adding about 20 billion square feet of buildings in that time. So we're adding buildings and continuing to reduce overall energy use. $4.6 trillion is projected savings. We've already, by doing this, by 2030, we will offset the equivalent of 620, 500 megawatt fire, uh, coal fire plants. Right? Huge. This is the one that's getting very exciting right now. Is that everybody in the United States believes that this curve right here, where we can become almost carbon neutral by 2025 in our buildings in the country, if we attend to currently available demand reduction technology. What does that mean? Solar panels, more efficient windows, air sealing buildings, insulating the buildings, LED light bulbs. If we get very serious about this curve, this is possible. And one of the things that we're excited about in California is most of this was happening outside of existing residences. Existing residences and commercial buildings, about 50-50 in the amount of energy used. In San Clemente, residents use 50% of total energy expended in San Clemente, right? In, in Claremont, where I'm from, 80%. So in order to meet any climate reduction goals that the city might have, Tom gave a really great description of what his city, San Clemente, is really working on this. In order for us to meet in San Clemente any serious climate mitigation goals, we have to have a way to get our hands around the residential stock, the existing residential stock. And it's difficult because 
everybody's different and there's thousands and thousands of people and thousands of homes and so we have to figure out ways to communicate something that's inspiring and give people a path to move forward that makes sense, right? So this is what we're focused on and we know that by 2030, this is around the corner, by 2030 we could save another 1.94 trillion dollars. Just to give you some perspective, trillion, what does trillion mean? It, you would have to spend a dollar a second for 32,000 years <laughs> to spend one trillion dollars, right? This is, this is serious money for a country and serious money when you take it down to a city size, serious money that we can put as disposable income back into our citizens' pockets. So by 2030, by exercising energy efficiency, we can, <laughs> we've already saved 620, uh, 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 500 megawatt power plants, we could save another 256 through energy efficiency efforts. How do we do this? So now I'm going to take it down to not the national level, but I'm going to take it down to the home, right? Because it's, you can extrapolate from a house to a skyscraper. What we have learned to do is once we started knowing and understanding that, that a kilowatt and a therm are precious things that we don't want to use and that actually the, the cost of these things are very high, not only in purchasing it, but all the non-energy costs in terms of health and pollution and all the things that we all in this room understand. Turns out that we've been building buildings that resemble more like a cardboard box than a thermos, right? Especially in Southern California where we don't have weather, right? So it turns out that when we, when we look at energy from a physics point of view, we start kind of understanding that a house operates as one giant physics problem in terms of trying to keep the energy that we're making cold or hot in the house longer. So if you buy a refrigerator, and there's holes in it. It's not going to keep our vegetables as cold as if it were a nice tightly sealed piece of equipment, right? Well, it turns out our houses are filled full of holes because builders who built them didn't understand that there's an energy problem here. So all of the holes in the ceiling in all of our homes have just been drilled. We put electrical boxes in there, no seal. And so there's air passing in and out between the living space and the attics everywhere. We've been putting in ducts from the chillers into the rooms and not really paying that much attention about how they're being sealed or how much they're being insulated. And so when you think about it, if you're trying to heat this room, or if you're trying to cool, let's say cool, because that's, that's a very dramatic thing in the summertime. If you're trying to cool this room and it's summertime, the attic is at about 140 degrees, right? So you're creating cold air and then you're running it through an oven <laughs> to warm it up before we get it down into the house. And then once it's in the house, because hot air rises and it creates pressure, it's shoving it right back out through the holes in the building that we didn't seal up when we built the building. Lots of very simple things, and we've got tools now that I'll show you a little bit later. We can put a big pressure blower door on the house and we can tell you exactly the cubic feet of air you're leaking per minute. And we know exactly what that measurement should be in your house, and we know where the leaks are and we can go fix them and make your house tight, right, the way it should be. We also have measurements to know exactly how tight it should be and not too tight so that you don't have to worry about bad indoor air quality, right? All those questions are answered now. Yeah. Yes? Um, I think Joel told me that the air in our house is dirtier than the outside air. I will show you. Thank you for that. That's a, really, that's a good segue into this. What we've discovered, since energy is a giant problem globally, 
we start attacking it and start looking at it on the micro level in, in a family's house. Turns out that by saving energy, we're also opening up a whole kind of box of other presents that are available to us. For example, once you turn your house more into a thermos from a cardboard box, you get radically more comfortable. The temperatures start regulating room to room, first floor to second floor, they start normalizing. You can control, if you want your house at 74 degrees, you can keep it that way both downstairs and upstairs because you don't have all the heat or the cool leaking out somewhere. You get radically better air quality in the house because all of these leaks are bringing in polluted outside air and as I'll show you some pictures, some very undesirable air from the attic which is full of insulation and unbelievable amount of rat feces and other things that you probably haven't cleaned out in a while. And so air quality, your house goes up in value. This is now being proven by statistics all over the state. You can adapt, not only are we mitigating climate change, but we're adapting to climate change because no matter what we do, temperature is going up. So we want more comfortable houses that we can close down and protect ourselves. So I'm going to go through about 10 of these benefits very quickly for you, just to show you. So savings, number one, energy savings. Did you know that between 2006 and 2012, energy costs went up 30%? And the next 15 years, the projection is another 47% in electricity prices, right? Energy is kind of like water or air. We don't really think about it. We just need it, so we just use it. and We pay that bill every month. If you start extrapolating energy costs, even at $200 a month, let's just say $100 a month. I'm preaching to the choir here, so I know there's a lot of people here with energy bills less than $100. There are many, many people, many, many people with energy bills easily at $300 a month. That's, 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 that's very common. We find that all the time. $300 a month, in 25 years, you're going to be spending somewhere in the high $100,000 to heat and cool your house over 25 years. Underwriters now when you're buying homes are starting to take a look at how energy intensive your house is because they see that as a cost of ownership for your house. That's why the houses, if you've got pro uh, uh, mortgages and uh, insurances, and uh, taxes, you also have energy bills. And now they're starting to consider that when you buy a house to see how much you can afford that house. So energy efficient houses, you're gonna, you can afford more house. That's why they're worth more. So you start taking a look at this and who, who would want to spend, you know, at $200, $139,000 over 25 years for energy when you could be spending zero. Net zero homes are possible right now. So here's Susan. She's house number four. We created a chirp in uh, Monrovia. We did her house about uh, two years ago. Um, so about a year and a half ago. So she got all her bills together to begin with. And then uh, she kept them for a year afterwards. Um, she got rebates back from the retrofit and from the solar back then at $7,000. She paid to total $18,000 to save $2,200 a month on her energy bills which extrapolated out for 25 years to a $72,000 payback. She paid off this, she, she earned back on a simple payback uh, formula in seven, what, 7.5 years what she spent. So she's, including the payback period, she'll, she'll save $72,000 in 25 years. Plus, now we know, because she's now having her house Greenpoint rated because Energy efficiency is the heart and soul of any green label. 40% of any green label has to do with energy efficiency because everybody in the green labeling world from USGBC to California understands that energy is the problem from a global perspective. Here's back, you know, that slide from the passive house in um, Germany to more like the houses that we've built that are leaking energy like crazy. Susan will tell you her home is more quiet and more comfortable than she ever imagined it to be. 
That's the other thing that I didn't talk about in terms of a benefit. We've had people who have had their house retrofitted where they have uh, insulation blown in the walls and adequate insulation put in the attic after properly air sealing. <laughs> there were two teachers who had just retired and they were spending all day in their homes for the first time in 20 years. They said they couldn't believe how uncomfortable their home was in the middle of the afternoon. So they called a home performance contractor to come in and fix their house. And they were working in their home office while they were fixing the house and they said they could feel the house getting quieter. <laughs> As they were working around the house, blowing the walls full of insulation and sealing up the air holes. This is for real. Houses get quieter and way more comfortable. Once we've sealed up a house, we can protect the indoor environment from the outdoor environments that are getting, with global warming, more and more pernicious moving forward. So for example, this is just in May. In May, already in California, we were fighting about 1,400 wildfires, which was twice the average number for a normal year. And I know, because we've had a lot of forest fires in our area, the outdoor air is not something I want in my house during that time. Not to mention the other kinds of pollution that are going on from around the world. 15% of the air pollution now in Los Angeles is coming from Asia, right? 20% of the mercury in the fish in the Willamette Valley is from China and Asia. Of course, they're just catching up to what we've been spewing out for the rest of the world, right? Ethan, Northern California, a friend of mine, home performance contractor, sealed up the house, attended to some mold problems that he discovered, insulated properly to keep out the, the attic air coming in and the air from the outside coming into the house. The, the, the air in the house got dramatically cleaner Ethan was going to the emergency room at least once a year. He was being hospitalized once a year. He was going to the doctor weekly. That dropped to zero after the retrofit. He was using inhalers two a day, right? This is, this is terrible. We have an epidemic of hay fever and asthma, and we dropped the inhaler use from twice a day to once a week, and he's now not absent from school. Right? These are huge issues. We have people all over the country compiling these stories so that we can create databases to show the correlation between energy efficiency and indoor air quality. Study out of Berkeley and, and UCLA quantifying thousands and thousands of homes in California who are green labeled are selling for up to 9% more than comps. That's a lot of money. 9% on the value of your house. So now we're running courses with realtors and we're training them how to identify green opportunities in both the buyer's and the seller's side and identify these things and set themselves up to differentiate themselves in their business by working with uh, clients who want to be green and spend less money on energy. Out of UCLA, uh, great studies now showing um, four to five degrees uh, hotter by 2050, and the number of days off the chart that will be over 95 degrees just by 2050 all over the Southland. Every city, like Tom was suggesting, because of AB 32, needs to come up with environmental action plans, and they need to start moving toward energy efficiency reductions. They, we cannot do that as a city without attacking the buildings both the commercial and the residential. Four years ago, we launched something called Energy Upgrade California. This is an unprecedented alignment of all of the utilities in the entire state with all of the counties in the entire state to help try and incentivize people to retrofit their homes and to give you thousands of dollars of rebates. So now the rebates are up to $6,500 plus. We have a person in Claremont right now who's got about $9,000 coming because it, the, the, the deeper you retrofit in terms of projected energy savings, the more rebate you get, right? 
We also now have something called the Energy Network, which is a county organization that is focused very specifically on every single sector around energy efficiency from residential to public to municipal, right? From commercial to, uh, to municipal. So we have a huge infrastructure and like Tom was saying, five years ago, we didn't have energy efficiency loans on the market. Now we've got several different ways you can borrow money to save and oftentimes the amount that you're paying for the loan is offset by what you're saving in energy, right? Many, many tools are available now that weren't even available a few years ago. Home performance contractors are the best people to get in touch with about these different instruments. Preservation and sustainability. I'm dealing with preservation organizations all over the Southland, teaching them to be able to understand, to help their, their, their um, homeowners in historic homes what a proper loading order is in terms of energy because everybody's being talked about, about you'll, you'll see a window company, a vital, vinyl window company is coming up to your house saying, you've got to change your windows, it'll save you 40% on your energy. Well, first of all, that's probably not true. Windows in this particular climate are one of the last things you want to do compared to air sealing and insulation and get the loading order correct. So you want to spend your best dollars first on the largest impact things that you can do. So you want to spend it on air sealing and insulation and, and duct sealing. You can buy more kilowatts with insulation than you can with windows in Southern California. Windows are great. There's a lot of reasons to change out your windows, but from an energy point of view, you want to start with the building shell and the air sealing, those kind of things. So there's a lot of conversation around historic preservation uh, with energy efficiency. One of those things is I'm going to leave you with a, a kind of a, a, a term, a loading order, because as you, everybody's faced with a whole bunch of stuff to do that usually outstrips a budget, right? So you've got to kind of put these things together. So once, once you have an energy assessment, you'll find out all the things you can do. Then you find out how much your budget is and you go down the priority lines until you don't have any more money that you want to spend on energy right now. And you do those things that make the biggest difference, right? Solar panels, for example, are the most expensive way to buy a kilowatt compared to insulation, right? So we talk about reducing the waste before you produce the rest, right? Makes sense. Reduce that 50% that every building on average is wasting, get all the other benefits, the comfort, indoor air quality, health, increase in the value of your home before you buy solar panels. And guess what? If you've reduced the waste by 50% in your home, gotten more comfortable, then when you go to buy solar panels, you need 50% fewer, right? 50% fewer of the thing that's most expensive to save energy, right? Solar panels are great because you reduce the waste, then you produce the rest, now you've got a zero energy bill, right? So net zero homes are possible and we're doing them all the time now. Okay, so this is, this is where the numbers get fun. In Claremont, we set a goal. We thought it was a big, hairy, audacious goal in the beginning. We thought it was a real BHAG, right? We were going to retrofit 1%. We put a stake in there going, we're going to retrofit 1% of all the homes in our town, which was 130 houses, because we have 13,000 houses. Well, we, we knocked that out of the park in a year. And then we had a giant celebration around that, the one that Sandy was talking about. Now we're up to about 260. I ran the numbers at 250. So this is just with 250 homes in Claremont. This is the benefit to the community so far. Utility costs saved over 25 years, $4.8 million in 250 homes. 500, pe 500 people are saving $4.8 million. Our next goal is $1,300 that we'd like to get in the next two years. That will create $27 million disposable income windfall over 25 years. And that's like we were talking about before, that's an annuity that just keeps on giving, right? We're working on changing LED lightings all over town. The amount of rebates, remember I talked about rebates? 
The amount of rebates that we funneled back into Claremont residents, $875,000 to date. This is going up every day. This is what we look, we'd be looking at when we get to our goal. Dollars invested in real estate, 3.4 million. Increase in property values, over $7 million, right? Just through energy efficiency and Greenpoint labeling these, these homes. So this is what gets exciting, and then from a city perspective, we're also interested in local job creation. So we know that we are creating dozens of jobs on the 130, and we'll be creating hundreds of jobs at the 1300. And the 1300 is still a minuscule goal. But the issue is, we have a really hard time of getting our arms around enough people in the community to kind of understand the proposition and trust it and know what to do from step to step in order to actually get these things accomplished. And that's what we're all trying to do throughout the state, is to reach you guys to let you know about the benefits of all of this. So we're changing the way we're looking at buildings and we're discovering a lot of low-hanging fruit. We do that by a, you co coming into a house with about $15,000 of very cool, sophisticated instruments that can measure all of the things in your house that have to do with energy. It's called the energy assessment. And if you have a qualified, certified person through Energy Upgrade California to do this, then you will know that you're getting a top quality assessment. There are a lot of cool things like blower doors to test cubic feet of air, test the flow. You want not only amount of air, but the speed of air in a particular room in order to mix the air properly so that you get proper temperatures from floor to ceiling. Our ducts, on average, are leaking in this state 30%. If, we, if, we, if you have forced air system in your homes in this room, if we went out and tested all of your ducts, the average in this room would be 30% leakage. These are, these are, I looked at that, first of all, I go, this is a travesty, and then I thought twice about it, and I'm thinking, this is fantastic, because how easy is that to fix? That's super simple. You can get up in the attic and fix the ducts. So you'll learn a whole lot of information on these tests. We won't go into it, to, to it today. Infrared cameras, we can show where your house is leaking air. This is in the winter. All of this should be blue. This is a 4,000 square foot, six-year-old house in Laverne, one of 400 in a tract, and every one of them was built incorrectly during current building codes, and they're leaking like a sieve because nobody knew what they were doing when they installed the insulation, right? Insulation, it turns out, really works, but, but you have to install it correctly. That's the difference. So here's a whole house fan. Seems innocuous enough. Here it is under infrared uh, uh, photograph. 118 degree heat coming down into this hallway in the summertime. Because it's 140 in the attic, don't forget, right? This little girl, this is a little girl's room. See the, the curtains on her wall? She was complaining. She said it felt like a waterfall of hot air was coming down on her when she was going to bed at night. Well, check it out. All the insulation had failed. It was not installed correctly. This is right over her bed. So the drywall was at 94 degrees. This is, it's turned, it turned the ceiling and the wall of her bedroom into oven and it's radiating heat down on her. This is what we're all experiencing in our homes. An infrared camera is a kind of a scary thing to bring into your house. <laughs> this, is, this is a light swag. Remember how I said we're drilling holes in ceilings and just putting in electrical fixtures? Well, Hot air is streaming in and out of this. You know how when you open a door, it depressurizes a room? The makeup air, when you depressurize a room, just by opening a door, let alone any wind on the outside, you're sucking in the air from your attic into your room. And when you close the door, you're moving the, room, the air from your room into the attic. Right? Leaking out. Smoke detector. 104 degree temperature streaming in around this. We can prove this with a smoke stick. All of the can lights in your home, if they were installed more than seven or eight years ago, all of them leaking. 
like a sieve. You've just turned the ceiling of your house into a colander <laughs> that air is coming back and forth in and out of. And what's in our attic? I know you guys didn't clean your attic last week when you vacuumed your carpet. Seri seriously, we, we have shovels. We have, to, we have to scoop animal feces out of some attics. And we're wondering about, there is a direct correlation between respiratory illnesses and energy efficiency in our residents. This is not an uncommon picture. Real quick, one, one of the cool things we learn in physics about building science is that hot air tends to rise, right? Well, it also creates incredible negative pressure here at the floor and incredible positive pressure. And if there are holes here, that air will go out immediately and it will suck air in here and here if you have a raised foundation home, right? What's in your, and what's in your basement? The, 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 the cats, the dogs, the rats, the, the raccoons, the possums, the coyotes that we're discovering in people's basements because you haven't cleaned your basement last weekend either, have you? So this air from the basement, due to the negative pressure at the floor on a raised foundation house, along with the mold, and the moisture is coming into your house. What is this? I taped all the way around a piece of plastic on this really beautiful hardwood floor. Depressurized the house a little bit with the, flan with the fan and blew up the entire plastic from the air that's coming from the crawl space. On a hot day, this, ha this happens by itself. On a hot day, 60% of the makeup air that you're breathing in your house comes from your crawl space because of the negative pressure bringing it in. My niece, who saw this, went back to Austin where she was painting her bedroom with her daughter. She went to lunch. She had left some paint buckets around. She came back from lunch, and all of the plastic was ballooned up between the paint cans. She knew exactly what was going on. So we can seal up the crawl spaces and fix it, right? Normalize the temperature between downstairs and upstairs, make the floors way less cold, beautiful temperature, wonderful to work in a crawl space like this. We've learned lots and lots of lessons. 30% of the ducts are leaking. 30% of the air in your ducts are leaking out. One of the cool things we've learned, of course, is that you should never, never use duct tape for ducts. <laughs> At 140 degree temperature in the attic, it melts. These things need to be glued and strapped forever, right? This is just sloppy. Nobody knew. Who cares? If it's leaking a little bit, who cares? Energy's free, right? We find this all the time. And then it gets worse. In the crawl space, on the ground, on the dirt, there's rips, rips in the ducts. And so every time the system comes on, it's sucking dirt from the crawl space right into the return, uh, return air grill, right? Which distributes it throughout the house. And then, of course, in the hot days, the rats really like it. So they crawl in, and they have their nest inside. And then the insulation and all of that rat feces gets distributed throughout the house. Once again, indoor air quality. We just haven't been looking at this stuff, right? It's just been out of sight, out of mind. We haven't cared. Now, all of a sudden, oh my gosh, you know, why is my energy bill so high? Well, let's look around, and we're discovering all these amazingly easy things. We call it low-hanging fruit. Why would we not want to fix this stuff, right? Everybody needs to know that this is at least an option, and to find out how much your ducts are leaking so you can see what you could do about it. So, I decided to retire and work on this stuff full-time because it just is too exciting. There's too much opportunity out here for everybody. We can make a difference is what I discovered is that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in every community who are sick and tired of just going to meetings and not doing anything and just talking about the problems that we're having when there are things that we can do. And when you know that the biggest problem that we're facing on the planet, we've got a lot of problems, but the biggest one is a greenhouse gas problem. And if the biggest problem on the planet has to do with buildings, 
Well, we all live in a building, we all work in another building. And if we could do something to change the energy picture of those buildings, we know personally that we are affecting dramatically the largest problem that we're facing. That's a, that's a really great feeling, right? So that's what we're doing. This is the entire city council of the city of Claremont. <laughs> they got super excited about what we're doing at CHIRP to energize the community about and saving energy. Because they started looking at those numbers that I showed you, what we're saving, the millions of dollars that we're saving, and the millions of dollars that we're increasing property values, and they're all about this. <coughs> Homeowners, their home is quieter, more comfortable. We, have, we, we actually even have a parade in Claremont about this. People are so excited. This is the mayor at the time and the head planner of City of Claremont. They got together and started passing out signs because we're numbering signs and giving them to people. We're doing community workshops like this. And then ultimately when we got to the 130 mark, we had an entire community celebration. Because this stuff matters. Once people understand that they really are making a difference and once, once their houses are retrofitted and they're more comfortable than they've ever been, this gets everybody motivated. So that's really kind of um, the big picture and the small picture and why the small picture working locally is the only way we're going to solve the global problem and, and take advantage of all these benefits. This is not just altruism. <laughs> There's at least 10. I've got a list of 20 benefits from energy efficiency. We can go on and on. The U.S. Navy has decided that the concept of energy efficiency is first fuel for the military, meaning that they have decided and understood the equation that burning fossil fuels is a national security problem from supply chains and pollution and all kinds of things. So the United States Navy set a goal by 2015 to have reduced all fossil fuel use in tactical and non-tactical bases and uh, planes and ships by 50%, right? This is serious, very serious, and a lot of very serious people all over the country understand this, and there are thousands of people in California working around the clock trying to get this message out to homeowners, because the homeowners are the last mile in this. So if we, can, if we can excite a base of homeowners in all these little communities and start working on energy efficiency, we can actually offset the need for more power plants. That's the big picture, right? This is, this is real. You know, uh, not too, too long ago, I read an article in the New York Times and that said that um, because of the toxicity, uh, toxic chemicals in our curtains, upholstery, carpets, etc. It's better if your house leaks. Yes. Because if you seal up, yes. you're going to poison the death of these toxins. <laughs> yes. And, and, so, and then, well, one last, quick last question. My husband was a civil engineer his whole life and a contractor, and I so wish he was here tonight. And I just want to know if, is that what your whole wonderful speech, do you find all that information on the Oh, sure, and, and, and just have him call me. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, here's, that's my email. Okay. And that's the website. Okay. And my phone number's on the website. Okay, I've got cards. I can pass them out. But I want to answer your question, which is a really great question because everybody has heard this. And it's true. We are poisoning ourselves from the inside out, right? Less and less because more and more people are understanding the cradle-to-cradle -cradle concept of let's not manufacture carpet with poison outgassing products, right? So things are changing dramatically, but there is a point where you do not want to obviate fresh air in your home. We know what that point is in building science and we reduce the amount of air in your home to that perfect amount. So what that amount is, is you want one third of the air in your house all throughout your house to change automatically about every hour. Most houses are exchanging way more than that, believe it or not. And so 
What we like to say, especially in pollution areas, like around power plants or inland, where they don't get a lot of clean air, we can actually take the ceiling of that building so that the building itself does not allow even a third per hour change. And then what we do is we make up for that with mechanical ventilation that filters the air from the outside. Very simple to do these days. So what you're doing at that point is you're allowing your house to lock itself down and you can control what's coming in and out when you want it to come in and out. So we, we've got protocols for all of that. And these, by the way, are national protocols. So the contractors who are working for this whole state uh, organization that's trying to drive education in this are very sophisticated in their understanding of the testing equipment and what, what it takes from a health and safety point of view. All of that has been worked out because that is a serious concern. We are also discovering lots and lots of carbon monoxide problems because people have been installing gas appliances incorrectly or, or you haven't checked yours for a long time and there's leaks and we discover those because we can't, we can't mess with the building shell without understanding the indoor air quality and part of that is carbon monoxide and we're discovering a lot of that and fixing it at, at, at the same time. And, we'll, and I'll pass out cards. So, let me just kind of uh, wrap up by saying that what Sandy and Gary and the Sierra Club are trying to do here is they all recognize, the League of Women Voters recognizes that there are a lot of people in the community who are very interested in doing something. In order to really do something of impact, we need to get a lot of people together and get everybody educated on the opportunities. And that's what we're doing. So what we're trying to do in San Clemente is create what we're calling a core group of people who would like to be educated in this subject and then start virally talking to other people. So for example, over the last two months, uh, we, did a, we did a workshop six months ago and we had, we, we've had uh, nine homes assessed. And so there's nine people in the League of Women Voters who can talk to you about what, their, what the results of the assessment were. And we're starting to get homes retrofitted. We've already retrofitted two. There's two more on the way. And so people like Sandy can talk about what, what's the difference in her home once it's been air sealed and insulated properly, right? So, this is about community organizing, getting a little bit of education, and we will help provide the workshops and the education and the steps forward if you're willing to get started. We're imagining chirps in, uh, we've, got, we've, we've, we've got cities all over the state who are interested and, and are starting to, to develop core groups, more, some more than others, but ultimately what we're trying to do is inst institutionalize this just like a Rotary Club. Right? This will become an organization in your community that people are interested in this particular topic and educating the community and trying to set some goals for the community to help the city meet their climate goals and to help our citizens save money and have a better quality of life in their homes. Right? That's, that's really what we're doing.